This video has been sponsored by PCBWay. Hello and welcome back! If you follow the channel, you know that we are trying to revive an IBM PS2 model 77 that died when we were trying to upgrade it to OS2. It's nothing simple, not the power supply, not the clocks, not the BIOS chip, not the processor. And thanks to IBM marketing geniuses, the PS2 is an intentionally undocumented design with proprietary IBM chips. And to add insult to injury, the board fell completely silently, no error code even appeared on the parallel port. So this promised to be a challenging debug, and in the last episode we called in for reinforcement in the form of Eric Schleffer, or Tooptime US as he is known on Twitter. To defeat the evil IBM Omnicorp, Eric used heavy artillery. He began by disassembling the BIOS code and hooked up the HP Logic Analyzer. He was soon able to show that the processor was starting properly, executing the BIOS startup code, but quickly halted on an error. He could even tell that the precise error was a register write in one of the motherboard chips during early board initialization. In other words, our motherboard is toast. But we are not giving up yet. Today, Eric is back to see if we can repair the board. And he has even designed a little custom tool to help out. What we've got here is a 3D printed plug that will fit into the BIOS socket and a socket that will hold the BIOS chip. And what we need is something to hold those two together. And for that, and for that we have an order. PCB way. PCB way. Open it up. All right. It says Merry Christmas on it. Let's have a look at that. So that's where it goes. Oh, it's a breakout. Yeah. Well, you couldn't have made it any simpler. It's very simple. So this is super simple, but also helpful. On one side, we'll mount the BIOS socket, of course, the side that says socket to me. And the other side has the 3D printed plug, the side marked shameless plug. And on the periphery, there are breakouts for our logic analyzer probing pins. So this should make our test setup a lot cleaner and we should get rid of all the acrobatic flying wires. But as neat as Eric's new gadget is, we won't use it quite yet. Because we got even more help from fellow YouTuber IBM Museum. Dave at IBM Museum knows so much about IBM PS2s that he has developed an impressive beard of knowledge. He graciously sent us a working Bermuda motherboard to keep our PS2 working, and even another dead one to scavenge chips to repair our own board. He also encouraged us to get one of the little parallel port code readers, although at this moment our parallel port is dead, but hopefully we'll get it going soon. Thank you very much IBM Museum, you are a class act. And now, thanks to your known good board, Eric will be able to do something else. Test the new custom BIOS he has been writing. So Eric is back uh, to play with our yeah, PS277 board. And uh, we have been blessed of having uh, got to a one, one that works by IBM and this is IBM Museum and you have been up to no good and making your own BIOSes? I have. So I don't know where the BIOS is failing on the broken uh, Model 77 board and so I've written a very short cut down version of the BIOS that lets me poke at specific pieces of hardware so I can troubleshoot one stage at a time. What I've got right now is my custom code in this memory chip in the working motherboard and so we can try that out right now and see if it works. All right, so here we go. It beeps! It beeps! Incredible. And that's all it does. So right, I can boots. control the hardware now at the register level. Excellent. So should we try it on the other fitting board? Let's see try it on the old works? motherboard and all see what right. happens. <laughs> RAM is overrated. Thank you, IBM Museum. Yes, thank you. Will it beep? Okay, uh, let's plug it in first. And let's see what happens. 
It does it beeps. beeps. Okay, so you have uh, control over our failed board up to this point. That's right. So that means that the failed board is running code. The mm. problem with this PS2 is it doesn't do beep codes. Even on the working one, it didn't beep at me once. Yes. A normal PC would go beep. This one does nothing. You will add that. But I have control over it now. <laughs> so that means I can patch their codes to add beep codes. Excellent. So I wanted Eric to explain how you you did the, um, the BIOS magic. So, so that's an assembly uh, language, right? You do in with, assembly. So which which assembly you use? By the way, you said. Yeah, so I'm I'm running the uh, NASM, uh, NASM. It's uh -huh. an assembler that's uh, open source and pretty common. A lot of people right. use it for x86 assembly. At this point, I asked Eric to go line by line on his beep assembly routine to give you a flavor of simple BIOS x86 real mode code. It's not that hard to follow, but if it's not your thing, feel free to jump over this section. And so this particular beep, uh, you program the pitch, so. and so you pass that into the routine, and that lets you control the pitch of the beep. Starts with uh, clearing out uh, AL. Which is uh, one it's of the accumulators. The, one of the accumulators, but it's the low part of it, not the high part of it. Okay. And uh, then what we do is we uh, copy the value 0x300 into the BX, which is another accumulator. That's the total length of our beep. Uh, and then what we do is we enter the inner loop here, and so the first thing we do is to XOR AL uh, 0x2, and that's just the bit that we're doing. And then we send that out to the port, and so that's out 0x61, AL. So we're sending that out to the PC speaker. Right, so, so bit 1, mm -hmm, which bit is one. OX2, mm -hmm. is the one that is hooked up to the speaker. So if, you, if you write zeros and ones, zeros and ones, it's going to beep. Right, right, right. Going to yeah, make so a frequency out of it. The, the next step here is to set up the loop counter. So we're using CL as the loop counter, technically mm -hmm. it's CX. Mm -hmm. And so we're copying uh, DL. D is another accumulator, and that mm -hmm. was we're using to store the parameter that's passed in from outside the subroutine. Okay. And so we copy that in, and then the next statement is just loop LP2, and that's just the delay loop. And the loop instruction on x86 just decrements CX. And then if it's zero, then that ends the instruction. Okay. So it's a very simple oh, right. way to so create a delay. They, they made it simple for once. Right. And then we do a subtract here of BX. Mm -hmm. uh, BX is the total number of cycles that we okay. want to do. Yeah. Next instruction is jump if not zero, mm -hmm. uh, back to the top again. And so basically it'll do that until BX reaches zero. And uh, that means that we've completed uh, beeping so, that out. So yeah. And then the very next thing we do after that is uh, we set up another uh, loop delay mm -hmm. here, and that's the delay in between beeps. And so if we oh, do multiple beeps, then we want to have a uh, delay uh, in between uh, right. to make them distinct. And so that's all that does. Okay. Well, and, and that didn't need any special chip initialization, right? It work, you could start your program right after that and, and make, right make your computer beep, right? Right away. So bare metal. And then you wrote something that test ports and beeps it out. Right. So the beep routine has a little bit more of complexity. At the beginning, it extracts the value of every single bit in an 8-bit byte, mm -hmm. and then it sends those out as individual beep. And if it's a 1, it's a high-pitched tone. If it's a 0, then it's okay. a low-pitched tone. Right. Right. But I'm, I'm more interested in the instructions that you use to probe the port itself. Sure. Let's take a look at that. Uh, what we want to do is explore the system control register at port 94. And this is the one we were having problems with. Yeah, so and, and port in IO is just like an address, except on an x86 we have addresses for RAM and addresses for IO. And the, the, the addresses for IO are called ports, is that correct? That's right. So yeah. IO port 94 is where we were running into trouble with the real BIOS. Okay. So when we went in with the logic analyzer and we noticed where it was hanging up, what it was doing was writing a number to port 94, reading it back, and then comparing it to what it had tried to write. And they didn't match, and so then it tried to error out and then halt the processor, and that's where our computer was freezing. That's right. why it was freezing. So the idea here is to write some test values to that port, and then read them back and beep them out so that right. we can hear exactly what's going on. So, right. so what we do here is we say, uh, uh, set up DX to contain the port, OS94, uh -huh. 
And then we zero out AL, which is what we're using to store the data. Mm -hmm. And then here's the out instruction. So out DX com AL. So you send zero to zero that address, to port 94. which is our, in our chip somewhere. Yeah, off in the chip somewhere. And the, the next statement is kind of interesting. So we're doing an out uh, 0x4f, comma, al, and 4f is not implemented in this architecture. What this is, it's, it's just a delay. Ah, so it's like okay. a no-op because it doesn't do anything, but it's slow because it's, it's it, an it I.O. Added, operation. Uh, it's yeah. a dummy instruction, really. And the BIOS uses this. The real BIOS does this pattern all over the place. Huh. So then we do an input. We're reading it into al. And now that's an AL, we call our function uh, bin to beep, uh -huh. right? So that'll beep it out. Right. And it should all be zeros so if everything be worked all, correctly. Yeah, so it should have been all, all low. Yeah, and then the second section here is the same as the first, but we write an FF, all ones, and mm -hmm. then we read it back and then see if any of those ones were actually written properly. So you should get all high beeps. All. And then we just do that in a loop. So at the end here, you just jump back to the top of the uh, of the main loop here. Yeah. Everything before that is essentially copied from the original BIOS. Where does it uh, start, by the way? It starts at the end, because the reset vector is down here at uh, linear address FFFF0. And what I've done is I've manually encoded a long jump, because mm -hmm. NASM has trouble with programs in the binary output format that span multiple segments. So this is a dirty hack to get oh, this to work. Segment stuff for the 80s. Yeah, yeah, segments are kind of a pain. Yeah, so that just jumps back here to the reset vector, which is at the beginning of the ROM. Another trick you had, another hack you had to do because you have to do function calls, but you don't have a pointer to RAM where you would normally put your return address. I have no RAM. It's yeah. not been initialized. So normally in a subroutine call, you have to push to the stack the return address. So when the function call is done, you run return, which pops a pointer off of the stack, and that's, that pointer goes into your program counter, and that makes you bounce back Go to back. Well, that's, where you came from. Yeah, we, we, we learned that painfully on the 1925 that we are, it was not reading the, the return address correctly right, and right. went out of the weeds because the RAM was not working. So here's the hack because, and this isn't my hack. This is something I copied out of the BIOS and it mm -hmm. took me a little while to wrap my brain around it. Oh, so they use it in the original BIOS. They use it extensively. Ah, but yeah, because they, they, don't, they can't rely on RAM either. Right, so the, the trick is, is that you, uh, first of all, you set up your stack segment so it's the same as your code segment. And what you do is you set up the stack pointer to point to uh, a, an address right after this jump instruction. Mm -hmm. And that address contains a combination of two bytes that acts as a pointer. You jump to a function, the function runs, and then you execute ret. What ret does is it grabs whatever's at the stack pointer, which is this 16-bit value, and that 16-bit pointer points to the very next instruction after this macro. Right, so, so NASM uh, sees this dollar sign plus two, and dollar sign is just the current right. program counter value, and so it puts it adds two to it and then puts that in as the data value. Yeah, that's how we program the 1401. We, you have to. That's the old way of programming stuff, right? You put your return address right after, and the processor looks at it and say, oh, "Oh, I have to return there," and which leads to the horrible self-modifying code, of course. Right? right, right, and of course you can't make this recursive because it's not a real stack, right? You're just yeah. you're cheating. You're you're making up numbers and keeping them in ROM. Yeah, but it works for one deep. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll put that, um, that code, put a link somewhere. So if you have jumped over the code section, the summary is that we write all zeros to our problem register, read it back and beep it out, then write all ones and beep it out too. And we do that over and over again. If the register in our chip works, we should hear eight low beeps followed by eight high beeps. When it fails, actually it goes to something different, usually all high beeps. Should we put the logic analyzer on it? So that's all high, so it's the port, that same port's failed again. Yeah. Hear that? Yeah. So it is that port. Mm -hmm. Heat it up with a hot gun? <laughs> yeah, cold spray. 
So by now we know exactly which chip is misbehaving and of course that's the one that includes so the parallel port driver. And that's when Eric used his miracle finger to repair the fault. It's this very position, so it's, right it's one end of the chip rather than the other. So it's just that corner right here. Break in the PCB? Because you reflowed that area, right? I did. Well, it could be a flat. Yeah, it could be something that leads to those other chips, right? You, are true, these yeah. involved at all? They could be. Well, but if you push the PCB from the bottom, that's another idea. It could be anti, something on the anti-flex opposite side of the chip. So now it's repaired, we can't make it fail again, and the parallel port uh, oh miraculously yeah. works, <coughs> and we get our, our codes uh, out of the parallel yeah, port. It failed and healed itself when you pushed on it. I wonder if there's anything suspicious underneath. I no, you tried to look, I couldn't see anything. But it kept failing intermittently. We could make it heal by just putting some cold spray on the chip. That's not an IC. So we are, we are trying to get the chip that you think is bad. This guy, right here, number 23. And we had a bad, uh, so once again, IBM Museum saved us and gave us a bad IBM motherboard that's already uh, there's some parts missing on it so we're just harvesting part and the trick you're going to use is chip quick chip quick so chip quick is this low melting point alloy solder and you just apply it to the leads all the way around and, and lift it right off Right, and then I had to look far and wide to find one that would still work with leaded solder because of course the chemistry of leaded solder is completely different from the unleaded Right, and you can't use the low melting point stuff which is most of what they sell now is unleaded and that won't work at all for leaded but I found one on Amazon, I'll put a link here in the description and I've never tried it so can you tell me it works you just remove one chip yeah let's give it a shot all right so and step one is to put this uh, paste flux down on the leads yeah you'll just flux the hell out of it yep lots and lots of flux so we'll just squeeze some of that out on there it's actually very tacky so it's not runny at all it doesn't flow all over the place it just sticks wherever you put it so I originally tried it with hot air but as it turns out you really don't need it because you just sort of blob this stuff down. It doesn't have to be all that precise. Although it does make a little bit more work later for the cleanup. So I got one side up. Oh, there we go. Starting to give a little bit more. Oh. Alright. There we go. So I'm just going to tilt this out of the way. How do you get it so clean on the other one? You, ah, you because clean, I cleaned it up afterwards. You cleaned it afterwards. What's and amazing is that if you zoom in here and look, that solder is still melted. That's the chip quick. See that? Yeah, because such a low... Ah, yeah. Such a low melting point. That just residual heat. Doesn't take much at all.
Then Eric went on to remove the chip we thought was bad on our other board and solder the one he just salvaged from IBM Museum's parts board. He did quite a clean job actually, that's the chip after he resoldered it. Right, well, see if we've, we've made a good board by replacing the chip and it can work without you pushing on it. <laughs> without the magic finger. With the magic finger. And guess what? It did not work any better. It would still fail momentarily from time to time. And you parted up while I was doing monkeying around with the Apollo stuff. And the last bit is one. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. So that's that's working now. So this is good. But what's weird is I had to put cold spray on here to get it to start doing this. So yeah, I heard it at the beginning it was all high pitches, right? Like like the when it was broken before. Yeah, all ones. So it's not the chip. It may not be. There it's may be some something. Well, oh, but then it's in the PCB then. And there is some kind of weakness. It could be. No, I think it may have broken itself again. Can, can I can I do my own try at the magic finger impersonation? Nope, my finger does nothing. It's not magic. Doesn't work. We have regressed. I think it's. I think your finger's not doing the trick. <laughs> Let me see. It's not magic. Yeah, and then we we have no power port. Huh? Yeah, you really need the magic finger. Yeah. It's just knowing where to put it. It's just once once it's in one state or another it stays there yeah oh it broke again oh it broke yeah I, 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 yeah I can probably tell on the video when it happened put your magic finger back What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> I have no explanation it for this. It is really magic. <laughs> now it's working. Great. <laughs> Eventually we sort of gave up, uh, built it back together while the board was in a good state and put back the original BIOS in to see if it would boot. Takes forever. Then it, it did generate a code. Exposition. There you go, there you go, there you go. It's changing. It's mm -hmm. initializing the video. There you go. Um, it's reading. It's floppy. Oh, there we there go. go. Now it's tr checking the memory. I only put eight megs in there. Good enough for me. I think the 301 error is the keyboard error. 161 is the uh, configuration error. It's another configuration error. Double beep? Mm -hmm. It means there is an error on boot. Which to me is hilarious because they could have beeped all kinds of error <laughs> information at me, but they didn't. You have to have patience of an angel to get this machine. Watch this machine. There we go. Show your magic finger. <laughs> it's it must be a board something. It's in the board somewhere. It could be. Yeah, it could be. It could be uh, via is gone. Th that's okay. We'll just when we boot it. <laughs> we just take my finger. Exactly. My finger. <laughs> the motherboard. We'll yeah, come and get machine. you, and you press with your magic finger, and it will work. You've got ten of them. You can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I 
okay, until then, I think <laughs> we'll use the other board that uh, uh, IBM Museum gave us. And ah, Wow, that's an unrepairable. We tried hard, but... Uh, I wouldn't say it's unrepairable. unrepairable it's just it's more work than we're willing to do yes, the best at this point. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay, we'll, we'll be content to use the magic finger. That's All right. right.